Right, hi, this is John Jay, and uh, fortunate enough this morning to be able to talk with someone I've been working with for a couple of years, maybe it's been three years, um, and I like to call him a new entrepreneur. And so uh, if you would, Sean, um, his name is Sean, and uh, he's been very uh, nice about sharing his experience with uh, developing something, uh, cash flow for himself, using a very interesting talent, very amazing talent that he's had that he never really thought that he could, I guess, develop. So um, I just want to illustrate what Sean did and, and let him explain uh, just so as an example for other people, maybe it might inspire some people or let you know that uh, it, it's within your reach to do things like this. So Sean, if you would want to make a couple of comments and explain how we yeah. got started. Yeah, sure. Uh, right. My wife, my wife was about to file bankruptcy and we were kind of looking kind of to get some information on just, we heard about a trust and we were having kind of our own frustrations with the tax system and just everything in general, the system in general. So we got your number through someone else and basically just called you up and, you know, wanted to kind of get what you thought about the situation. And you talked us very quickly out of bankruptcy, which is a great thing. And started the, started the process of explaining kind of the system and the possible ways to get out of the system and to operate freely and just kind of like a whole different way of living and seeing everything. Um, and that for us was like, almost like you were talking a different language, which I guess you were to some degree. <laughs> and uh, we would listen and we'd probably gather very little bit because it was even just some of the words like PMA, I didn't understand what a PMA was. I didn't understand almost anything. So I would have to kind of stop you and say, can you explain what that is? And you were always so kind to say, yes, please, if you have any questions, just ask me. Um, so I was in, we were in the process of kind of, I was working for myself. I, I had a business and I was looking to transition into the woodworking business. And we wanted to operate from a trust, operate freely. We didn't want to operate under the normal constrictions and, you know, the old system that we were operating from. And so then we, we started to operate from a different way. And it's been a while since then. And I don't want to say I'm there yet, but I'm much, I'm much closer to operating freely and um, very different out of the system and kind of still learning as we're going along. Um, what was the original uh, situation? If you could talk about that briefly, what was causing you to think about filing bankruptcy? Well, my wife had so much debt and mm -hmm. I had debt too, and we were just tired of paying debt. So we thought if we file bankruptcy, then, you know, we, we can get out of the debt and, you know, and it's, it's possible. Just, you can do that. Yeah. 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 And, but so what was my, I mean, not, not to interrogate you, but I want people to, to know that, um, I, I explained this, if I remember correctly, uh, I explained it in this way where you explained how you got the debt and the purpose of it. Now, it wasn't like you had a gambling addiction or it wasn't like you had a drug problem or something like that. It was, you were using it responsibly. You borrowed money from banks who are suited to lend money and you bought assets. And the purpose of it is to have the assets service the debt and it didn't work or the timing wasn't right. So the, the, the next th thing is that I explained was that this is a normal process. This is a normal thing that entrepreneurs do. They use other people's money with good intent. And sometimes it works and sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. And the best person to get loan money from is someone who's suited to loan money, not your grandma and not your mom's personal savings, but literally international multi-billion dollar organizations known as banks, right? And you did that. And so there's nothing wrong with borrowing the money and not being able to pay back with the purpose that you had. And so what I, my recommendation was, is to continue to do that. Think like an entrepreneur and still look for another opportunity to take other people's money and still do it and try to make it work. Now, probably to this day, you probably have creditors saying, hey, where's my money, right? Yeah. You probably do. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're, we're much better. We're much more out of debt. I think there's a whole system, um, I guess, language that is you know, basically geared towards putting us into debt and to basically selling the idea that you could have things that you don't have the money for and you could buy things that you don't need. And you know how it is. There's just this whole system around that. And what you were trying to tell us is that, listen, you don't have to think like that. You can buy a business. You can go on this site and buy a business that's already up and use that business to create revenue to then use that money to build or have whatever you want. I don't know how it's going to go, but you, you just kind of planted the seeds to help us think different and um, 
basically understand the new thought process around being an entrepreneur and not you know, using money to be in debt to get things that we don't need eventually and just owe everyone money and not have not have much of it ourselves. <laughs> yeah, so, and the thing is, once you're looking at that situation differently, you're, you're still going to spend your time every day dealing with it. So I just showed you a different way to look at it and a different way to deal with it. You're now in a situation, if correct me if I'm wrong, that if you wanted to, you could pay the creditor because now you've taken the money that you would have paid them or that you would have not had access to if you filed a bankruptcy. You've taken that and built a business out of a, an amazing talent that you have, which we'll get to. And, and you now have nice cash flow that if you wanted, you could pay off the old liability, which I'm going to be the per first person to say, never do that, but you could, you now have the freedom to choose that. It's not, you're not a victim anymore. Yes. Yeah. And you taught me that first year I, I knew that I was painting at the time and I still am. And it was kind of transitioning from painting and doing woodwork, which I loved. And painting was kind of the money avenue and woodworking was the passion. And I just wasn't there yet. Um, and I'm actually still going into that. But what I learned from you was using my money to also put into investments that can make us money, more money later instead of putting it into debt. Um, and just the understanding that allowed me to save probably $20,000 that year and invest in a lot of different things. And Amazing. just, again, okay. learning, learning the entrepreneur or how do I say it? It's more like it's like a whole different lifestyle, but I guess understanding how to use money instead of it use you and understanding how the system works and how to build and really, I think, financial freedom and personal freedom as well. And I think you said it yesterday when we were talking about this, you said it was your mindset. You, you, you have a mindset of doing a thing and, and then everything builds from there. And so maybe you lack a little bit of knowledge, but your intention is to do a thing differently than you did before to get in that situation, right? So you got that situation. So let's change a little bit of how you're going to do it. I've been in a situation where I've borrowed money and haven't been able to pay it back, or it took me extra long time to pay it back, you know, and I try not to borrow money from people that, you know, it's not their life savings and things like that. You don't want to do things like that. You clearly didn't do that. You didn't buy a bunch of consumer goods and then say, oops, I don't have the money to pay it back. You legitimately were buying an asset that was a pretty good bet. The timing was just a little bit off. Yeah, I was, I like to use the word programmed. I was very programmed though, yeah. in the way I looked at money, spent money and had money, very programmed sure. um, from sure. the past. And it was kind of like, well, if I wanted something, I didn't have to wait because I could just put on a credit card, which was kind of silly. So then it creates the thing where now you always have what you want, but you're always in debt no matter what you do. And I didn't really understand that until I started basically talking with you and, and just started on this process. And now like I won't buy something unless I have the money for it because I know that's just going to put me further back. And that's something I had to learn and really undo with the way I thought, because the programming is strong. You know, the, the, yeah. whole, the debt thing is very strong yeah. in America. I don't know about anywhere else, but I know here it's very strong. Um, yeah. Get stuff now. You have to have it now. You can't wait. And then why, why not get it now? Because you can have it now and pay for it later. And yeah, that yeah. catches up. And that's why I've seen people over the years, they'll go through cycles of two bankruptcy periods and they're usually about maybe 15 years apart in in the worst case scenario so i've seen three um but in yeah. one lifetime so uh yeah it, it is there there's the programming and so after we got through the a lot of the technical things and the the vernacular the vocabulary you know and there was i was i, I have a tendency to talk fast and 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 i know and so i know that it was new to you and you were very patient to, to just hang in there and hear me out and so i then got to the fun part when i asked you what is it that you love to do, what you just were saying? And what is it that you have proficiency in? And you were explaining. So you have these two things. The thing that pays the bills is I can go out and provide a professional service. At that time, it was painting. But you have this thing you love to do that wasn't paying you yet, which is what? Oh, that's the woodworking. Woodworking. And that's what you said. Yeah. So we, had, we didn't even have too many conversations about that. Just a couple of technical things over the next few months. And then you figured out how to, what, if you would describe what you did when you explained about, you told me what it, with the woodworking you were doing. Can you please tell everyone what is this talent you have? Okay. <laughs> so I started doing woodworking a bunch of years back and basically I just fell in love with wood. Like if I'm in a room with wood, I get happy. And just something that, you know, makes me happy. I love wood. I love working with wood. And <clears throat> I work with a finish that's organic, no chemicals, no hardeners. And 
we were going to shows and I kind of didn't know what I was doing. Um, when I was talking to you, I did. I was, I'm just trying to give people some background story. And <clears throat> I, I think you went mute. Oh, there you go. And you did out for a second there. What was that you were just saying? I said, um, basically, I had um, a bunch of boards I was kind of selling for cutting boards and serving trays. Mm -hmm. Okay. And someone said one day, you should put a hole in it for a wine bottle. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, how the hell am I going to do that? That's a big hole. <laughs> so then I, start, I started to research, like, how can I put a three and a quarter hole into a big piece of wood? And that started the process of learning how to do that. I figured out a bunch of different ways and um, came up with the wine and cheese Lazy Susan where the wine sits on the board, in the board, in the hole, and is able to spin, and you can put food and cheese and appetizers on it. Um, so that was kind of our invention. And when I was working with you, I already had invented it, but I was looking to expand it. I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be more, you know, like um, available for people. And you were tell, telling me about a 3D printer. And, you know, I was just, again, is trying to figure everything out and do everything and, you know, be part of my own process without getting too far ahead of myself because I'm good at that. And so basically for the first year of that, when I was working with you, it was mostly by hand. I did most of the work by hand, which was very laborious, but we would sell out at shows. I mean, we would go to shows with 60, 70 boards <clears throat> and we would sell out by the end of the show. So it was really cool. That's amazing. Not only did I love doing what I did, but so did other people. So it was like a win-win. And people, it was funny, people would, they would call us after the show and say, hey, do you have any more of those Lazy Susans? And I'm like, I got three left. And they'll be like, I'll meet you anywhere. It was <laughs> I'm going to go get, I'm going to give the one that you gave me. I'm going to share, okay. I'm going to show everybody. I don't want to interrupt you. So uh, yeah, explain. Uh, so and, and explain about, so you have this, so you developed this talent, you learned a couple of skills. And so how did you turn that into something? And I'm going to step away for a second. So if you would, please explain okay. how you kind of developed this into a thing that, that makes a lot more money. Okay. So I first started doing this work. Like I said, um, it was very basically just, I didn't really know what I was doing and I didn't know what I wanted to make. And I also didn't know what the market needed. I just knew I loved wood and I wanted to make wood and not everything sold. So as we were going to the shows, uh, I was making end tables and coffee tables and stuff like that, but they weren't really selling and they were pretty high end exotic woods, but people weren't interested in paying for the prices that they were worth. And it, it stopped being worth it for me to purchase that wood and try to sell it. So basically that one day when I had a big piece of wood on the table and was just using it for like a serving tray or a cutting board, when someone said, you know, put a hole in that wood um, for a wine bottle, it took me a long time to be able to do that because putting a three and a quarter hole in a, in a big two inch thick piece of wood is not easy. Um, so I finally did it and people went crazy. They were like, does that spin? Is that, oh my gosh, can you? <laughs> And it just, it's from there, it just started to, to go. And then actually we didn't have it on a Lazy Susan at first. It was just a hole. It was just like a, a cutout for the wine bottle. And then someone said, you should put that on a Lazy Susan. And I was like, what? Not, I don't even like Lazy Susan. You know, I had my all my opinions about it. And then right. I thought about it and I was like, wait a minute, this is not about me. This is not all about me. Right. This is about, I get to do what I love and then provide something for people you know, for people that they love as well. And I have to be flexible with, you know, the creations. And that's when I started to step back and look at it in a different way versus this is sure. all about me and my wood versus, hey, like be flexible. You may not like every design you do, but you get to do what you love and you're selling out of shows and people love it as well. And that's when I started to look at it more as a bigger picture but than it being personal. It's somewhat of a business way, a business thing instead of a hobby. Yeah. Because you're going to serve the client. Um, and so you have a you have a special thing about finishing the wood and you get you have a source for a particular kind of wood. And I want to show what the one the, the lazy Susan or turntable you did. Mm -hmm. You let me have this and there's your wine bottle spot. And mm -hmm. now this is the, here's the uh, the, uh, you know, the hardware on the bottom. Oh, yeah. It turns very nicely. Yeah, it, it's, this is a very heavy piece of wood. So now, yeah. did you make this with your hand? Yes. And, and some tools. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. This this is amazing, guys. I mean, th this is what what kind of wood is this? That is mango wood. Mango. Yep. 
I would have never thought that you could have a mango tree, you know, with a, was it the trunk maybe of it? This is well, pretty solid stuff. So Mango wood is very popular in Costa Rica and it grows like very, very, they grow, the trees there grow really big. So we have a, someone we work with a sustainable business who has hundreds of acres okay. and provides sustainable wood. Um, so you have your supplies, it, you have your yep. art, you have your yep. understanding of what people like because you know when you sell out. And so mm -hmm. then it's just a matter of putting all that together and working out arrangements to get your supplies. And then you have a unique arrangement with, uh, what is it, a storage facility? Yes, right. I did. I left. I left that one. But I, yeah, I had my okay. I had my workshop in a in a storage unit and two storage and, units. Yeah, uh, next... and you're not supposed to do that. No. But sometimes you can get things done just by talking to people. It's probably outside the lease agreement, but you know, if no one else is complaining, then you're probably going to get be able to do it. So, you you can get into those situations sometimes just to get started. Sometimes it helps just to be able to get started. So you got to think outside the box a little bit. Do stuff that people aren't willing to do. Like you kind of, you kind of did that. Well, it's funny. It's kind of like I think what you represent and kind of what we're talking about is that I think we have a lot of limits. I had a lot of limits, and what we don't see, we don't know how to tap into or understand. And sometimes the impossible happens, or something happens that's just like almost you can't even explain it. You're like, how did that just happen? And, but it only happens when someone's willing to step into something they don't know or willing to do something that is beyond their limitations. Yeah. And we were moving into a, um, a place. It was funny. Me and my wife were moving into a place and there was a garage that I was going to start doing my woodwork out of. And I think it was like the next day we signed a lease and my wife was like, Sean, last minute, I found this totally new apartment building that is brand new. It's way nicer than the other one, but there's no woodworking space. And I was like, then we're not doing it. <laughs> and she was like, but I found a storage unit down the block that is temperature <laughs> controlled. I mean, this is last minute. Wow. wow. And she was like, are you open to even looking at it? I said, of course, of course, yeah. honey. I mean, I'm open to anything. Wow. Like, And it was like, if I was any type of rigidity, if I was set too much, it, it just opened up. Not only did we have a place that was brand new and probably 10 times better than the other place. But I had a storage unit where the, the ladies were so kind in there. They said, you could, you, you could plug your machines into it. You could, here's an outlet in the unit. You can basically do whatever you want. And it was like, whoa, the doors just kind of opened up for me, for us. That's really amazing because we, you, we could not have sat down, no matter what experience either of us had and, and written a business plan that said, you're going to do the thing. You're going to do it that way. It just worked out that way. You took advantage of things that came up and your, your wife got involved and, and she, she was looking out. And so things just developed that way. You just have to take advantage of them. Yeah, I feel like you got to be open beyond our mind and you know our whole mental structures. I feel like life mm -hmm. is really beautiful. And when you go into creation mode, when you go into the impossible and you just don't know what's going to open up for you. And that happened for us. And I have so many stories like that that just I couldn't have imagined I could have never, like you said, planned what happened a better way than how I just had to let go and go, all right, well, if it's meant to work, it's going to come in. I can do the work, right? Only yeah. so much. But at some point you have to let go and go, all right, well, let's see what happens. And have that end in mind. Like you already knew that you have this brilliant talent and that you're just going to, people love it and that you're going to put it in their hands and they're going to pay you for it. And so how I get there, I don't know, but I'm open to whatever it takes to get there. Yep. And so what, uh, what is this? There's a technical thing that you were telling me about. So, uh, a lot of woodworking people, uh, they use a finish or something that's an epoxy, you said? Oh, yeah. So most people use like a regular epoxy or, um, you know, there's so many different finishes out there. But when I started, um, polyurethane's another one. When I started doing the woodwork, I started in my apartment at the time and I was finishing wood in my apartment, like, you know, because I didn't have a space. And the mm -hmm. chemicals from the, you know, epoxy and urethane were so bad. I was like, I can't, I, I can't do this. Like, I can't, I can't. Yeah. And at that time, I was finishing redwood um, burls for coffee tables. So it wasn't food orientated. And again, m my relentless butt just kept calling and bothering people and saying, you know, this, these finishes are terrible. <laughs> you guys know anything else? And so basically they said, yes, there's a guy um, named James and he has a product called Odie's Oil. And Odie's is a non, you know, non-toxic food safe. You could basically eat the finish. Um, wow. And so 
and I called James and he was, you know, a New York guy from New Jersey and we hit it off right away. And he's like, I'm going to teach you how to use the finish, but you got to, he goes, do you have any prior woodworking? I was like, no, he goes, good. So you don't have to unlearn too much. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he, he right. just, he told me you can, you know, you can get any finish, you can get any sheen, you can get whatever you want with our products if you use it correctly. And if you're looking to, you know, use a, a non-toxic finish on food items, he goes, this is the product. This is the best product. So. Um, so that's that's a really good uh, thing to understand because so you went to find this particular way of finishing wood because I mean as almost a necessity, and as it turns out I mean you now have a way of doing this which is unique, and it's it fills a need where people are going to use this type of product around food, and and maybe some people are allergic to those chemicals or maybe they're dangerous and so you've got a special way to handle that that's probably I don't know that a competitor of yours would ever find. Jason, that's the name, Jason, right? Oh, uh, James, James. James, I don't know that they would find him. And yeah. So you have something there that most people will not have. Yes, and it's, and it's, I was really grateful and we're good friends now, James, and I actually sell Odie's for him. I'm a distributor. Okay. Yeah. But a lot of people will say, it's even says on epoxy bottles that once this item is cured, then it is food safe. And that just doesn't feel right for me. It's like, yeah, when you're putting like salami, I mean, I have pictures of people that send me like, look what we did. And there's like salami and there's all this juice. You know, I just doesn't feel right that it to be on um, chemicals that are hardened that are, are supposed to not, you know, are, are supposed to be food safe after yeah. hardened. So I was just like, yeah, it doesn't. And that maybe sounds... That's a sales pitch right there. That's that right. What you just said would be a way you would explain this to your customer, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of that. I mean, yeah. cause he'll hear that pitch from others and you'll say, yeah, but you know, it just doesn't seem right. You should get this product. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you know what, it really comes down to, um, you know, having all, um, being authentic. That's what I felt. It was yes. like, I, I'd rather be out of business than be in business and be inauthentic. And that's, yeah. I mean that hundred percent. Yeah. And um, Absolutely. so that, to have a product that could be harmful to people, like I, I would never do that, even if there's a, a slightest chance. If there's any um, question, right. Yeah. So now you just I glossed think, over something that, go ahead. What was that you're going to say? No, no, no. That basically I was just expanding on that, but yeah. yeah. All right. Well, you just glossed over something that I, I like to mention a lot and you have, you want, you have this uh this finish from james it's his product what was the name of the product odie's oil odie's oil mm -hmm. i never heard of that of course mm -hmm. uh and you distribute this right mm -hmm. yep so why not because it's one of your suppliers and why shouldn't you distribute it so now you're not just promoting your own product you're promoting someone else so it all works together you see how this it's like a synergistic way to do things you're involved in your suppliers, promoting your supplier's product because it's not competing with you. It's also making you look good. It's a, a value add for your customer. He might want to know what kind of finish you have there. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what entrepreneurs do. They're always taking advantage of things, um, looking for opportunities to better serve others. Um, and there was an issue I remember we spoke about briefly um, on the sales tax. You were trying to get some supplies. Does, is that gone or did you change your product? There was an issue um, of buying from a supplier. Oh yeah, he wouldn't sell to me unless I had a um, basically a sales tax. Is it a license or something? But so he yeah, didn't he, want to sell it as a retail. He wanted to sell sell it as a wholesale, and therefore you'd had to have a sales tax ID. Yeah, we tried to get around it, but he wouldn't budge. So sometimes you not, can't get around it. Yeah. Yeah, he's just not the right person. That's all. Yeah, and you can make that decision or get it or whatever. Yeah, but I mean, there was nothing illegal about it. Um, we've I've done that with other clients where uh, they were d involved in sales tax. And for one reason or another, I don't try to deliberately get around those situations. But in, in this one other guy's case, he was an auto mechanic. It made perfect sense for the way he was operating his repair shop to get around the sales tax to get rid of all that. So in your case, all, all you did is just change the change your involvement and you don't you don't need that supplier. You just change the product or whatever you did right yes and maybe in the future we'll be able to um do something with it. the product that that guy had was amazing and went so well with our boards oh, okay that I, that and, and that you could find another supplier or something or if yeah. it's really that important i mean sales tax id is not a big big problem it's just i just one less thing to have to deal with but that's good to yeah. know yeah yeah it was a liability we didn't really want to be part of yep Yep. Um, now there's a couple, a couple more things I want to ask you. So one of them is you had mentioned recently, we were talking about you, you're looking at getting some equipment to make your job easier. So you're at a point yep. now where it's going well, right? 
regular cash flow. You're still doing a lot of labor, but there's some equipment that's going to make it easier and safer for you to do something. Yes. So originally I did almost everything by hand, not by hand. I was still using tools, but I was using my own labor to, you know, to cut out the boards and all that. It was, it was pretty hard. And I recently actually, I'd had some injection stem cell injections and stuff just from years of doing that. And so I found out there's a machine, a CNC router machine where you can program it. Not only can you program it, but you can design on it. And when I saw this machine, I was just, I was so happy. It's expensive and I, I, I can't afford it yet, but I think within maybe a, a couple of weeks I'll have it. And it just brings it to a whole new level, which kind of connects with where I'm at. Now me and my wife can create new boards together and we can have the machine do a lot of the hard work that would actually hurt my body. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can produce more. And then we have more possibilities for clients and different types mm -hmm. of pieces for people designs. And maybe you can bring in some, some labor to help out because they yeah. won't have the same, they won't need to have the same skill that you have possibly. Yep. Yeah. And, yeah, and this may be, yeah. And the pricing on it, you were saying, it may sound like it's within your reach reasonably, but at the same time, sometimes if the price for this equipment in this example is a little bit more than what you'd be willing to commit to because you're putting cash into something. Yeah, it's going to turn into part of your business, but you're still tying up some cash. And so sometimes the equipment, it might make sense to lease it. I don't know if it would in your case, because it's enough to where it's not that much. It's not like a million dollars, but it's, you know, it's a chunk of cash. Mm -hmm. So you always have the option. You can buy it or you can just uh, lease it. Right. And if you lease it, you get the benefit of the maintenance and, you know, the upkeep of it, whatever. Uh, from the uh, from the owner yes yeah my again part of my process is learning to wait because I'm very ambitious like you and <laughs> and like I said in the past I would buy it right away and you know uh -huh. everything would go yep. wrong it'd be like the shows weren't ready we have no money now we have to pay this bill it's like so I've learned how to wait and I've learned how to listen and I've learned how to just like make sure I'm not pushing too hard and what I got was for myself is that yeah it's not time yet in a month we can buy it now if we want but it's just not time yet so don't force it because you're going to get smacked back with it and that's what happens when you force things in my experience yeah. is I get smacked with life life goes no you're pushing it this is a this is a great example okay I want to expound on that a little bit so, so here's what I recommend sometimes so you're making money you see there's a better way to make money it makes your job easier you can become more productive but you're making money and your sales income or your income that you're making is going up. There's, there's growth. Okay. So I'm like you, I, I'm going to still exhaust that money-making, whatever I'm doing, I'm going to keep using the same resource I have and not improve my productivity while I'm making more money until a point. My chart looks like a flat line. Almost I'm making more money to a plateau, right? Then it's mm -hmm. not, I'm, I'm reached a plateau. So in order to make more money at this plateau, I need to probably be more productive, let's just say. Mm -hmm. So I need that equipment. Then I decide to put mm -hmm. the money into the equipment. Yeah. And then my, my return on capital becomes greater. And so I like that thinking. I mean, it makes total sense. What, why, why change it if it's not broken, right? Even though it's not the most efficient, you don't have to have a perfect system all the time. Makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's talk about Sean's bragging rights. What is your, uh, what's your <laughs> biggest, your biggest day, your biggest weekend? What, what is your claim to fame so far doing this? Uh, are you meaning with like making money? Oh, yeah, making, making money. money, popularity, fame, fortune. What, what do you, what do you Oh, think that's is? a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember, so recently actually we went to a show and we sold almost every piece so much that we had to stop selling because we had another show. And I was like, well, we're not going to have enough pieces. I think we sold $12,000 in three days. That's amazing. Wow. And it wow. was to the point where people were like, are you Sean? Like <laughs> <laughs> telling their friends. And like, I almost, I became like popular. You're the like guy. Sean, <laughs> Sean, the lazy Susan guy. It was really yeah. funny. right. But it was, it was really like, I just felt really grateful for it because it was cool because the work and the, you know, the thing that we created became so popular that people were like looking for me and they sent their kids. To, you have to see Sean, talk to Sean. Oh, that's amazing. And, you know, they would come looking for me. It was really right. cool. 
and we so we wow. thought then we would sell out every show of course that's what i thought okay and we, we wound up traveling and we didn't sell out and you know we had our ups and downs but it just uh -huh. taught me again it, it brought me back to balance and taught me that we may sell out sometimes and other times mm -hmm. we may not so that you know there's just a balance with everything and just I, i'm and i listen to pe uh, customers because customers always have a lot of Mm -hmm. you know insight and tell me things and so i'm always just listening to customers what they think what they say um just for new ideas and new products yes see what they want right see what they want. yeah it's definitely worth talking to them yeah certain things i'm like nah i'm not doing that sure <laughs> but, but if four but then, people ask you at one at one weekend you're, you're going to look into that yeah and then my yeah. wife because my wife is very creative so then she was like i would love to do that and I was like, really? And she was like, yeah. I said, okay. So it, <laughs> then it brings the possibility of us collaborating together because I don't really like the plain Jane stuff, like the cutting boards with the family names on it. That's really not my thing. But my wife right. loves that. Okay. And people she love like, it. I mean, there's a market for it. Yeah, it's big for real estate. So she loves the stability of it. And I love mm -hmm. creating, creating, you know, the the boards more and and those things. So there's a cool partnership mm -hmm. and it's important that things are balanced out. It's not just me and it allows the business to go to a different level, which is great as well. It makes sense to have a product, a common product that is, there's lots of competition for it. And then you have another product that's really unique that you can't find anywhere. Um, so, so to bring this up again, this is, this is that lazy Susan, by the way, my mom's name was Susan. And when I was little, I always thought my dad was just making fun of my mom saying that she's lazy because we had <laughs> lazy Susans throughout the house. They're plastic things. I just thought that was interesting, but um, yeah, this turntable. So this is pretty solid, right? So yep. one th one like this, this is heavy. It was like well, maybe almost ten pounds, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, what is this? What do you sell this for? Uh, I think that one goes for like one sixty five. One sixty five. Yeah. One sixty five. That's yep. that's pretty amazing. I mean, that's a that's a pretty good high ticket item, but it's that is if if you priced it less, I mean, if you could price it less, it probably wouldn't sell as well. I think if you price it more. In fact, you might even see more sales when you increase the price because it's that kind of thing that people don't need, but they would love to put that on the center of their dining room table and next to their you know, flower arrangement or something. They'll pay that because they know it'll be around for 50 years or whatever. Yeah, our items don't sell. It's, they sell out pretty like when you know the, mm -hmm. the markets and the people that have a lot of money because they're mm -hmm. not needed. They're not, you know, these right. are extras. And so the people that have money when they see it, I have people buy six of them, seven of them sometimes. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, because w there's always a gift that there's always the one person that has oh, everything. Yeah. And when you wow. see that, and if you drink wine, and even if you don't drink wine, I mean, there's those holes you can put ramekin jars in and, and yeah. dips. When they see that, they're like, oh, my gosh, I have to get this. And so I always give people a discount. They buy a couple. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the, one of the items. If the people drink, if it fits what they like, that's the present then is the most unique that people interesting say. so that that get, that gets me thinking about a, a service like if you were to have a customer come to the booth for example and, and make this order you would offer the service of hey you know we can gift wrap this and drop ship it for you if you like you mm -hmm. know and and there's another cost there so yeah very interesting I, so so yeah you want to know more about your customer and what he likes are they paying for this with a credit card or with cash 95 percent credit card or debit card so you have a merchant account yep Yep. easy enough yeah okay and if yeah. you want to sh show it again i could explain the back because the hardware yeah. on the back is very different than a normal lazy susan yeah okay yeah so what what i found was the normal lazy susans use another piece of wood as the as the bottom and i was like oh. i don't want to i don't want to waste a piece of wood so what i did was those holes i drilled in rubber feet oh yeah right here so the rubber feet are actually a, a, a screw and a bolt bolted yeah, in it is, so, that, yeah. so that it protects anything that's on and we're not wasting another piece of wood for it. And it was nice. Yeah, this is people, one solid piece of wood. Yep. Yeah. When people see that, they, they're very impressed because most Lazy Susan have another piece of wood on the bottom. And my thing was, well, why would I do that? It's mm -hmm. kind of wasting a piece of wood. And so I, mm -hmm. I was in Home Depot one day running back and forth to the screw sizes and the holes. And yeah. it took me an hour and a right. half, but I finally came up with it. And my wife was like, oh, that's really good. That's sturdy. And yeah. So you actually went and put all the all this hardware together. Like you just, there is nothing like this. You just kind of like 
pieced it together, now you know what what you need. Yeah, I mean, I, I bought I bought the heart the um you know the lazy Susan hardware the round mm -hmm. metal thing. Yeah. But I I designed the the rubber feet. Yeah. Part of it because most people put like a glue on rubber feet and they never last. So I was like, well, this is going to be used a lot, spun a lot. Let me use a bolt and a screw and some really yeah. heavy. That's thick rubber right there. Yeah. And and so yeah, the the, the the things I use with it are high priced. They're very mm -hmm. they're good quality. high quality. Yeah, high quality. That's your niche market. Absolutely. You're not going to, you don't want to save 50 cents. You want to spend $3 instead of save, you know, save 50 cents Yeah. because of your customer. He's not yep. trying to buy like my fam. My dad bought plastic lazy Susans <laughs> when I was little, <laughs> but this is, this is high quality. No, I put it in my, uh, my dining table and uh, my neighbors, my neighbors from our, our previous neighborhood, we're still friends and they come over. <laughs> they drive from their new neighborhood to our new neighborhood. And uh, they're like, wow, where'd you get that? You know, we, then that's a conversation for an hour, you know? Yeah. So, and some yeah. of the new designs will have like three, three to three to five holes. So I'm designing yeah. ones where there's holes on the end where you can put ramekins, you can mm -hmm. put wine bottles and even for like parties where you can basically serve on them you can have a bunch mm -hmm. of couple bottles of wine and it, it'd be bigger for serving and you know just some ideas like that mm -hmm. well all right well i'm going to ask you this one thing so if you could say something to other people based on this story that you've just given this authentic real you went through this mess for what two and a half years or so that from what i've known you what could you say to people that might be listening that maybe you think would inspire them or just encourage them to do something that they love like this? Um, I would say a couple of different things. If you don't have something that you love or that inspires you, get out and try different things and find it because it's definitely out there. That's one. If you do have something that you love, but it's not, you're not able to make enough money with it or it's not in the, the way that you want, maybe you can. You just have to find new ideas and talk to people about how you can build it or, or kind of, use it in a different way because a lot of times you can collaborate certain things with other things that will allow it to be bigger in your life if, if that's what you want um and yeah i'd rather make wood all day long than paint but i had to paint the last couple of years to get here and so there is sacrifice there's not just i do what i want and i have fun I'm like i had to sacrifice a lot of time to realize yeah i don't want to paint houses the rest of my life i make good money but i love woodwork so it was a, a good sacrifice and I learned how to use that sacrifice into, you know, creating what I want and having fun and doing shows, which I love, I love doing shows. And um, I think, yeah, so I think that there's endless possibilities. You just have to think outside the box it comes to that thinking thing again. And, and you have to keep your day job sometimes. And, yes. and that's an acceptable exchange trade off, but ultimately you may end up doing the thing you love uh, exclusively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of information out there, but you don't, you know, you just have to live your passion and, you know, and I feel like that kind of cuts out life lessons. Like sometimes a job that you hate the most teaches you the most. So it's not always getting what you want. It's about sure. learning, learning from what you have. And it's a process, definitely. Yes, makes sense. Thank you so much, Sean. I'm going to end this now. Appreciate everyone tuning in. Yeah, All thanks. All right.